You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello and welcome to our latest Garibaldi Red Summer Special. My name is Matt Davis. I'm delighted to be joined by the last manager to take Nottingham Forest back up to the Premier League 2021 years ago now, a long time ago, but delighted to be joined by Dave Bassett. Dave, hello, how are you? Very well, good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us. Are you a bit surprised by that stat that a club of forest stature isn't in the Premier League since you took them there? Yeah, well, I'm well aware of that uh, as we went up and they've never achieved it since. So, yeah, I was aware of it. It's a long time. Uh, I never thought that would be the case. But, uh, you know, these things happen in football. Times can change if you don't make the right decisions and the club's not run correctly and you don't get the right people employed in it. You find yourself going backwards instead of going forwards. Um, we're here to talk about your Forest journey. I know you've had a lot of success at a lot of clubs. Talking of Forest, then, how, how did you end up at the club back in 1997? Well, I was manager of Crystal Palace at the time. I'd been there just over a year. And uh, my accountant uh, was contacted by Irving Scholar, who was a client of the, the business. And Irving uh, spoke to my accountant, uh, Malcolm, and asked if he'd have a word with me uh, regarding my situation and whether I could be interested in being involved with Nottingham Forest. He realised I lived in Sheffield and I was down at Crystal Palace at that time. So my accountant did come and speak to me and and I said, yes, I'd be happy to talk to them because my contract was only 18 months to run at Crystal Palace and I'd spoken to Ron Nodes uh, about either increasing it and lengthening it if he wanted me to stay longer uh, to bring my family down. I wasn't prepared to bring them down uh, with 18 months left. So it was that situation. So um, in that time, Irving Scholar did speak to me um, about it and I had a good chat to him. He was telling me what was going on at the club and um, he sold the idea for me to come and help Stuart uh, Pierce and be a uh, uh, director of football for that period of time till the end of the season when changes would be made in the summer. So I was then fully aware of where the club was going and what they wanted. Um, And uh, at that time, um, I spoke to Ron Nodes to say that I'd spoken to Irving uh, Scholar and he was okay. Um, And I left them to chat and I told Ron as he wasn't prepared to extend my contract and and the salary was less than what I'd been earning at Sheffield United, etc. Then and I was prepared to, to speak to Forrest and um, he didn't make enough attempts to, to keep me in that terms. I think he felt that I wanted to go north. That wasn't necessarily the case. Um, so it led to me then really tying up with Irving and he paid the compensation to Ron Nodes that he required. And I went to Forrest in that June at that particular time and uh, worked with Stuart but uh, till the end of the season. And uh, then, obviously, we were relegated at the end of that season. And Irving then approached me to say that he wanted me to be the manager to get the club back to the, um, the top division because Stuart Pearce also wanted to continue playing. And that was pointed out to me when he f- saw me in the first instance that Stuart's managerial cr- credentials weren't exactly that of an experienced player. And with my promotion successes, etc., uh, they wanted me to be instituted uh, in case the club got relegated, which looked like a distinct possibility when I joined the club. And that ended up uh, with me coming. And Stuart was obviously wanting to carry on playing. He was part of the England team and everything everything else so it was obvious and it was obvious probably Stuart wasn't going to stay at Nottingham Forest he would want to play in the Premier League which was understandable. Um, What kind of club did you walk into then did it feel a bit doomed when you walked in in terms of relegation you felt like you had a, a big job on your hands to pick them up? Well, I wasn't running the team at that stage. You know, I was coming in. So I wasn't coming in to hijack Stuart out of the way at that time. I was there to support him and give any help on any coaching when he needed it. But basically, I was there to oversee and see about players and how we could strengthen the team. Um, 
before the transfer deadline, which we did. We signed Pierre Van Hoyden at that time uh, in the hope that he might be able to score a few goals because that was a problem. Um, so, yeah, I was there. And uh, uh, again, you, uh, to, to assist you, not to sit on his shoulder like a parrot telling him what to had to do. You know, he'd been around football and uh, he wanted to continue that. And uh, we conversed. We got on OK. And uh, as I say, I dovetailed him because I was more or less certain that uh, I was going to be manager the following season, come what may. So you take over in the summer then. Um, what, what were your feelings about that squad? They had quite a good core of players. Obviously, Stuart was going to go. Were you quite comfortable with what you had and you just felt you had, needed to add a couple more to bounce back? Yes, obviously the, the, the squad was a decent squad. He'd been in the Premier League and they were experienced and I was confident that there was enough good players there. It needed some infusion of players. I mean, Van Hoydon was uh, brought in and um, I felt that... Uh, in the Premier League, he didn't do us any credit in that particular few months when he joined us because players have to settle in. But I felt that uh, he was going to be a decent player. Kevin Campbell, I loved uh, from Arsenal and knew, but Kevin had hardly played. He'd been injured. So I felt that with those two up front, we had a, a firepower that was there. Of course, Steve Stone was there, the Chris Bart Williams, Ian Wone, Scott Gemmell, um, Steve Chettle and Cooper and Mark Crossley you know, were a good backbone to the side. So I felt that we needed to improve in one or two positions. Um, obviously, the left-back situation was going to be a situation that needed looking at with Stuart going. I felt we needed more thrust in midfield and uh, I'd, I'd done scouting around. And as I say, during that time, I'd f followed Alan Rogers and had good reports. So we made a move to get him in at left back. Andy Johnson at Norwich had been watched uh, continually and was a robust all-action midfield player that uh, was available. And we managed to get him as well. And Jeff Thomas, I always knew, was a, a decent player, experienced, been around, done it, played for England, was a very, very good choice uh, on a free transfer. I knew that possibly injury-wise he might not be able to do all the games, but I certainly knew he, he would add something to the midfield area. So we, we managed to add one or two players like Thierry Bonalea to give us cover at full-back, left-back and right-back as well. Um, so I was, you know, I was fairly confident with it. And buying John Helder from Norway, I was well aware of him because I was tracking him at Crystal Palace uh, and uh, we were able to buy John to add to the centre-half cover. The only problem was that Mark Crossley got injured and um, uh, with a back problem. We signed, we had to sign Marco Pascalo, the Swiss international, but for some unknown reason, it didn't quite hit it off. And we signed Dave Besson, you know, later on as the season went on early on in terms of bringing experience to it, having worked with him and knew that he was more than capable to add experience to the squad. So let me ask you about some of those players that you brought in there. There's obviously good players, but there's quite a few characters there. I mean, did you know what you were getting with Alan Rogers when he he, he sounds quite lively as a, a character and Andy Johnson? They sound like a hell of a double act. What were they like to, to manage? Well, I, I didn't know the, how quiet they were going to be. Uh, Andy Johnson certainly turned out to be a bit crazier than I thought he was. So, <laughs> but I was I was well aware that he was a character and he was lively and um, he was full of confidence. Uh, he, he, he wanted to come to uh, to Nottingham Forest. He could have gone to Crystal Palace, Steve Koppel, because as I said, Andy Johnson was on my watch at Crystal Palace, and obviously they decided, and Ron knows that they thought that uh, uh, with Crystal Palace getting promoted at that end. Of that season um, obviously I was looking upon well I should have stayed and got promoted with Crystal Palace but that wasn't the case but Andy decided to come to us because he felt that Forest was the right club for him so you know that he could have gone to the Premier League straight away but he felt that he could add to it and uh, Alan Rogers again funny enough was, had been tipped off to me when I was at Palace uh, by Steve Coppel because his uh, father was a Tranmere Rovers fan who said that Alan Rogers by, was by far the, you know the best left back in that division as he was at that time and so again we used that and Alan was 
clean. And of course, they were lively lads. And, you know, I want characters. You want characters to be stand up. Obviously, they were coming into a squad where there was quite a lot of experienced players, and there was no point in having any shrinking violets in that uh, team as such. Obviously, it was a bit more delicate with Thierry Bonalea and uh, John Helder coming in because they were coming from foreign countries where obviously the culture is a bit different and usually these type of players are not quite as flamboyant as some of the English players as such. And of course, we had Van Hoyd already, who was a different type of individual and very confident. Um, and as I say, I felt that we had enough defensive work people to do a good job and midfield creativity as such. And also, we, we had a good firepower up front. Yeah, I mean, how did you manage that dressing room then? Because you, you've been at Wimbledon with the kind of the spirit that had been there, you know, the reputation rules and have that crazy gang spirit. What did you, uh, how did you handle that forest dressing room with, with some lively characters and experienced players? What were you after there? Well, I didn't obviously d d handle it the way I'd go. Uh, Shelves United and, and uh, Wimbledon were totally different situations. These players were different. Uh, they were used to a different style of football. Um, people would say I was going to long ball. Well, we didn't play long ball at Forest. Anybody who saw us, we played total football. But you've got to pick the players that can play the way you want to get the best out of them. And trying to play long ball with that team would have not been correct. They wouldn't have been used to it and they weren't geared for it uh, athletically. Uh, they were a football inside and we added footballers to the team. So uh, we, we ended up, uh, you know, playing, you know, good football that suited the team and scored goals and entertained uh, in that season in, you know, reaching record points and goals and uh, etc. Is that a gripe of yours? The kind of the reputation of long ball that you seem to have because... Like you say, that Forest team didn't play long ball stuff. They played horses for courses. Is that something that irks you a bit as a manager then? Not really, no. You're, you're, you're lumbered. But, it, but what I did was at Wimbledon was a miracle. It's one of the best soccer stories in the history of the game. That what was achieved at Wimbledon, what they did. Um, you know, so what we did was correct. It was the people, other people decided that this was the wrong way to play. And they didn't like it because it's hard to play against long ball. It's very physical, very demanding. And you have to be athletic. And so certain players have, can do that. And the Wimbledon team and Sheffield United... They covered the, the yardage that you needed and they played to the, their strengths and it always caused problems. So you you know if you're upsetting people and you're being successful, the reason they're trying to do it is decry you. But of course, the media jump on the bandwagon and like to criticise it in all the teams at Wimbledon. We always went out to win. We didn't play like passing the ball around at the back just for the sake of it. We wanted an end product, which was uh, scoring goals and uh, and we were very good at it. And Sheffield United, the, the stats that Sheffield United and, and Wimbledon on their set plays was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, but of course, people then suggested that the game's not all about set plays, it's like rugby. But of course, you, you criticise it. So, um, you know, if I'd have tried to play the Nottingham Forest way um, with Wimbledon and Sheffield United, I wouldn't have been in a job very long because it was totally different players to horses and courses. But of course, all that Wimbledon team all went to play for top Premier League football, or well, not in the Premier League and in the First Division. And all those Sheffield United players played for four or five years in the top division. So they were all good footballers in a different way, but it was getting the best out of them. And uh, I was well aware of the way to get the best out of Nottingham Forest wasn't trying to play long ball. And the same when I was manager of Barnsley, totally different football. So that's what a coach is. You get the best out of the players. It's not what you want all the time. You know, you have to, uh, you know, cut your cloth accordingly. Um, last one on Rodgers and Johnson, because Forest fans have heard so much of them as some of their antics. Uh, Frank Clark was on here talking about Stan Collymore and he was a pain to manage. And he kind of let the players police the dressing room. Is that something you did as a manager as well? Or did, were you even mocking in with them at times? Well, I believe in being strict at the right times. So I can be very liberal, but the, the players don't run the, the, the club. The manager manages, the directors direct, the players play. So we, we had a problem with Van Hoydon that he wanted to be chairman, director, uh, uh, director of football, uh, captain and coach. Yes, we'll come on to Van Hooydonk in, in, in depth, probably, I'm sure. If we go through the season a little bit, um, 
you got off to a flying start, which I, I assume obviously helps as a manager. And then you never really had any bad run at all on the way to promotion, did you? I think it was like three games was your longest winless run. It all Did it all go as well as it could possibly have done that season? It could have been better. There were, were games where I was really annoyed. One was Bradford City at home when we drew two all and we'd pulverised them and were two nil up and then gave two silly goals away. You know, which if we'd have got two points from that game in the second half of the season, we'd have been promoted a couple of weeks earlier. So, uh, it, 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 yes, it went well, obviously, because the players gelled and they mixed and, and uh, they were a good bunch. I mean, you know, I, I thought I enjoyed the players. Um, the only problem I had was Van Hoydon, but he's a problem to everybody. We knew that when we signed him because Tommy Boyd had had problems with him at Celtic. And if you looked at Pierre's uh, uh, history, you know that he was a, a problem player. Um, let's talk about Campbell and Van Hoydong then. Before we get on to the kind of the character aspects of them, what about them just as a football pair? Did they... They must have jailed pretty well. They seem to work well together. Yeah, well, they they they, they scored the goals, uh, fifty three goals. Right, yes. So you've got to say that's a, that's an excellent return. Uh, as I say, Kevin Campbell was a player I rated very highly. You know, he was prepared to run in behind players, whereas Van Hoydonk didn't. But Van Hoydonk had some great skills and ability of taking up positions to score goals, and and he was superb at penalties and free kicks. I would put him up there easily with Beckham in that respect because he's, his ability to take penalties I think he, he's I think he's only ever missed one penalty and uh, one of the amazing parts uh, where I remember going to the uh, 98 uh, World Cup and uh, he didn't take penalties when Holland were in a penalty shootout he, he wasn't on the pitch as such you know and uh, I'd, have, I'd have backed him against anybody and he scored some, some great goals from free kicks but of course what we analysed Kevin ended up with 23 three goals but Kevin was brought down about six times from penalties and six times from free kicks which Van Hoydon converted so um, Kevin did, you know got the positions to get the penalties and everything else but so it was ideal that we had a set piece specialist in that respect um, with Kevin creating the opportunities which was the case because Van Hoydon really didn't get brought down for a penalty uh, or, or any of those situations yeah, from what you're saying there, I mean, like Campbell, I think he's got the rec he's the record English goal scorer without playing for England in the Premier League. I think so. Uh, would you actually say, in your opinion, Campbell was perhaps the better player given his all round contribution? Yeah, at the end of the season when we had the situation, we'd got promoted, and I thought we was going to move on and buy players. Um, uh, we had a problem, and uh, against my wishes, uh, Kevin Campbell was uh, sold. I'd have kept Kevin Campbell and sold Van Hoydon because Kevin Campbell was more valuable to the team than Pierre was. Um, and Pierre, and he was less of a problem. He was a, you know, great fella. He, he combined well. And uh, as I say, he, he did a great job. I wanted to keep Kevin Campbell. I actually signed and agreed a contract with Kevin Campbell before I went off on holiday and missed the first weeks of training because I'd spent all the summer trying to manipulate, but the club wanted money. And I still, to this day, I was sold down the river uh, by the directors of the club selling Kevin Campbell um, and not uh, getting him to sign the contract, which he was meant to do the day after I went on holiday. And the excuses were used to not uh, to make out that the contract wasn't quite ready. And then Kevin through his agent, found out that the Turkish club was prepared to pay Kevin net what he was going to get gross from us. So all of a sudden, Kevin Campbell could receive all of a sudden another 40% increase in his contract and obviously wanted to go to Turkey. So that was a great disappointment. And then you had the whole Van Hoydonk strike situation. I mean, how do you look back on that at the time? And do you think you would have done anything differently now you know, with 20 years in hindsight. Well, the, would problem, you the problem was, uh, as I say, Van Hoydon thought he was uh, better than he was. And uh, he was in the Dutch side that played in that uh, 98 uh, uh, your firm finals, but of course it was uh, then that the De Boer brothers decided to go on strike at Barcelona. It become uh, sort of the in vogue things for players to go on strike. So he decided to go on strike. Now he was he, one of his arguments was that 
you know, selling Ke Kevin Campbell, he, 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 he was against you, of course. I was against it. And, uh, he, you know, he felt that the side needed improving. And I was well aware of that as well, because when we came up, it doesn't sound a lot, I was promised that originally if we got up, we'd have £8 million to spend on players. Well, then the reality is that the club needed th over £3 million because the share issue, etc., and things had gone wrong. So that was available. And, and obviously, Kevin Campbell, I first found, was my first interference from uh, board level with Irving Scholar, who preferred uh, Pierre Van Hoydel to Kevin Campbell. So he wanted to get rid of Kevin Campbell. He actually wanted to get rid of Kevin Campbell when, when I was uh, made manager, but I wasn't having it because I knew what Kevin Campbell uh, could do for us. So uh, we, it was a problem. Again, with regards to Pierre, you know, for me, to, for a footballer to go on strike is absolutely despicable to actually do that, to not care about the team. I wanted the team to be improved, etc. But of course, that wasn't the case. And we had another problem where Pierre wanted Wim Young, another Dutch international, to sign for us. And I didn't want him in midfield. Uh, he wasn't athletic enough for what I wanted. And he went to Sheffield Wednesday instead. And, and, and my, my, I was proven out that he was unsuccessful at Sheffield Wednesday. He was nowhere near the success that they wanted. So, but really, as I said, it was none of Pierre's business who we wanted to sign. That was down to us. But unfortunately, we wasn't in a position to sign players. What was the relationship like with Irving Scholar then? I mean, I've had other managers on here before and they've all had rocky relationships with the board eventually. Was yours kind of difficult with him throughout or did it deteriorate over time? Well, uh, Irving, I, I didn't mind Irving as a as an individual. Irving's a football man. He was at Tottenham. Uh, but Irving liked to interfere. Irving thought he was the manager and he's got a view on football and he's quite hard work in that he's there. So, you know, I wasn't at all happy when he rang me in America on holiday to tell me that Kevin Campbell were, wanted to move to Trapanzor. He gives, gives a different story to it. But Kevin Campbell rang me and put me actually right in the picture that he went in on the Monday as he was meant to it took about four days of excuses that the contract wasn't ready or there was this hadn't happened etc and the same was Scott Gemmell at the same time so it was a problem so realise the first time uh, in my managerial career that I had people trying to tell me what to do as a manager you're involved to, to run the team and manage the team if you do well you take the plaudits if you don't then you know you can get the sack but of course in this day and age now most of the owners want to recruitment or a head coach so that they can tell the uh, manager or the coach who they're signing which we you know is not my view of a manager is what's the point in somebody get, telling you to sign when you don't want to because you the job as a manager is to know where the players are know what players you want and do the scouting and go out and do it because a lot of the managers and coaches don't ever go out scouting and managing they just watch videos which are completely inconclusive in that you want to watch what players doing when the ball's down the other end of the park or somewhere else uh, what is he doing is he tracking back is he tracking players is he working hard as such so when you actually go and see you see a totally different picture to what you see on video so how hard was it building a squad after promotion then Dave because you signed players like Dougie Friedman and Neil Shipley who were decent pros I'm sure I mean Shipley didn't work out at all but well we, we, didn't have, we didn't have money did we we lost Colin Cooper for two and a quarter million pound uh, to uh, and Middlesbrough as well so we had a problem John Hilder was going through a difficult spell it was difficult we, we, we I've lost Campbell and uh, Pierre Van Hoydel up front all of a sudden we haven't got no strikers and so it's, it's difficult with very little money. I, I managed to sell uh, Ian Moore uh, to Stockpool. And with that money, I was able to get hold of Dougie Friedman, who was at Wolves, who I knew was a decent player. Uh, but his time at Forest was a little bit difficult. And Neil Shipley, Neil did a great job for me. I signed him for a million pounds at Sh uh, Crystal Palace. He ended up leading goal scorer. He had a, a, had a real terrific time. I knew Neil wasn't as good as Campbell or, 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 or Van Hoydel, but the choice is available with the money I had. And we got Shipley for 700,000 quid, 
Now, you know, you weren't going to get many other Premier League clubs doing that. Palace had been relegated and Neil wanted to come. But then again, I proved my point. I went to manage Barnsley and Shipley was an absolute, you know, well, I got him from Forest for about 500,000 and Shipley did brilliant at Barnsley. Unfortunately, he had a nightmare at Forest. He just didn't work out. And of course, you know, people are comparing them to with Campbell and uh, Van Oydel. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's impossible, you know, in terms that, of course, Campbell and Van Hoyle are bad, better than those two players. Another player you got in was Jean-Claude Darshfield. What was it like with him? Because he had such a terrible tragedy in his personal life. His wife and children had died. Um, what, that, was that a big challenge to manage a player like that in this situation? Yeah, I took a chance with Darshfield. I didn't know enough. I knew he was quick. I knew he could score a goal. And the early games... Very promising, the Arsenal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Unfortunately, he's uh, he blew up. He soon come. He didn't like training. He was lazy, and then his performances deteriorated. He was more interested in the girls in Nottingham and flying around in the flash cars and having a good time rather than being a professional. So uh, he turned out to be a waste of time. And uh, again, uh, sim- uh, re- reiterating to me to not take any notice of the directors who were doing the scholar was keen on Darshaville coming, the agents were all this, that and the other, and I took a chance and uh, basically he, he proved to be a damn squib. You actually started the season pretty well, didn't you? It was it was an uphill task, but were you pretty happy with how you started? Uh, well, we should have got a point at Arsenal, Darshaville killed Martin Keown with his there and, and, and that performance. And then we were done uh, with a free kick in the last minute with an absolutely, you know, reasonable challenge by uh, uh, the tank or uh, as such and on the right. And they scored from the free kick, which meant it was 3-2 three, two, three, two instead of 2-2. Two, two. So there was a point lost. Yes, and you're right, We the players worked hard and, and we managed to get a few results together. But I was well aware that we were well short um, of being Premier League. We, were, we weren't as good in terms of, of players. Jeff Thomas was struggling more with an injury at that particular time. And one or two other players weren't playing to their potential. Of course, there was people, experienced people like Stoney around and, and Woney and Scott Gemmell and Stevie Chettle, who were around and Mark Crossley, are seeing and thinking, well, we're a weaker team than we were before. So that get, makes it a little bit despondence. And, uh, you know, it can easily come in for players to do it. And then when the results start to go against you, obviously it's very hard for the players to motivate themselves. Do you think, you say that, you think the players realised they were coming up short of, of quality and yourself then? Was that the general, did you, you well, knew that at the time? Well, I think the fans knew that. Anybody who was watching would have thought, well, this team ain't as good as the one we had last year. You know, the problem was the share share issue that had gone on the lane market and the, it hadn't gone as well as the people thought it was. And, you know, we'd, we'd sold players for, you know, six million odd quid and, and spent about two and a half million. So, you know, you, you, you come in the Premier League, it's a, you know, and you've got player, you know, other clubs spending a bundle on players, you know that they, they've got the quality. We need, you know, if we'd have kept, kept the side within range, then we would have had a chance to stand up and then been able to add to the right areas. You know, as I say, for all of a sudden, when I was told if we got promoted there, eight million, well, all of a sudden, that eight million is turned into a three million deficit, you know. And and the worst thing we should have done is is that we should have sold, sold Pierre. And in, in terms of there, you know, I wasn't having him. And, but what if I look back now, um, it got personal because I just lost respect for him. And I know a lot of the players did. All right, some of them didn't say it, some did, etc. And if we'd have got Pierre back at the start of the season, we should have gone over. And the problem was Van Hoyden was, uh, sorry, but Scholar was very close to Wim Janssen, who was um, Pierre's agent, and uh, Pierre, and he was speaking to them, which he shouldn't have been to be there. But what we should have done, and I should have done, and Scholar, we should have gone to Holland and we should have said to uh, Pierre, come back and we'll sell you straight away. Because there were clubs interested at that time. Leeds were very interested at six or seven million pounds. 
Now, if we could have sold him to six or seven million quid and the club had given me eight million, as they promised, we'd have had 15 million. So we'd have had a totally different Forest team from what actually was the reality. And of course, eventually, you know, the, the, I, was, I was under pressure. I wasn't having it. And the, pre, the board were then seeing that their so-called investment, Van Hoydon, was going down. It wasn't suiting that uh, he, was, he was stuck in Holland. And so yeah, I was then put under pressure to say, well, look, bring him back and uh, we're selling. We brought him back. And, uh, uh, we did have an offer, I think, from Leeds for five million, uh, which was less than the six or seven that was talked about. But that was turned down because the board thought they'd get more. Well, the reality was Pierre didn't play well, didn't score goals, and uh, gradually his value went down. And hence, he went to Vitesse Arnhem for three and a half million at the end of the season. So uh, a complete uh, mess up. So when he came back then, I mean, I guess you, like you said there, you thought he was going to be sold to Leeds for five million. I mean, how was it having him around the squad with a struggling team? I mean, it, uh, he's a good player, but did it, it make it even worse after November when he came back? Well, there was an atmosphere, you know, I mean, the, the, there were players that were unhappy uh, about the situation. I was unhappy about the situation. Um, uh, and uh, I felt I'd lost a battle. And I didn't get the support when I needed it, really. Uh, I had a lot of people who, and managers who rang me and said, uh, Harry, you, you've done right. But uh, again, you end up because the money men decide what happens. Uh, they, they run the club and you have to go along with that. If it's jeopardising the club financially, I can't expect to overrule that situation. Uh, and uh, it, it ended up a mess, really. You know, what looked a good promotion looked like we could go on and consolidate in the uh, the premier league build up and build a side that could challenge for uh, the top six at some time in the future no, I'm not, i wasn't suggesting that i was going to take forest into the top six in the next couple of years i felt comfortable there but i felt if we got it right and we got the right young players and we could recruit well then we could achieve anything because I'd done it with Wimbledon. I'd got Wimbledon to the top six. I'd got Sheffield United always, uh, who were a club who was selling players anyway, uh, you know, always to halfway in the league. And I'd have settled with that with Forrest. And, you know, hopefully then we'd have had one or two youngsters that would come through the youth uh, at that time uh, in the future. And also the recruitment could be involved with getting good athletic technical players. So by the time you left the club around the January of 99, I mean, do you think there was a manager in the world who could have kept that team up or was it just rotten to the core and had to go down, really? Well, it's easy for me to say Ron Atkinson failed, didn't he, miserably? Uh, you know, I don't think any manager would have done because I think the players were shot. No, no, I'm not making an excuse for the players, but it, it must have been very difficult for them when they, after the effort they had put to get promoted, to, to get up and then see the club the way it was, really. Um, so I, I, I don't think any manager, but of course you can't, you know, you never know. You know, things happen, but they went for Ron, they thought Ron would do it, and um, it, it, it failed. When you left, um, were you angry? Was it almost a relief? Because like you say, there was no way you were going to keep that team up. What were your emotions? Well, I, I knew I knew who would take the, who would take the uh, responsibility with Van Hoy coming back. You know, uh, he scored a goal, but you know, some uh, congratulated him and everything else. Um, and there was an atmosphere. And Van Hoy had disregard for me. He didn't respect me. He thought I was a long ball manager and all the rubbish that goes with it. But you know, the problem is if you start listening to the players, then you've got a major problem. But at Forest, they did listen to Pierre. And uh, obviously that effect. So once I said to my wife when Van Oyden would come back, I said, it's not if, it's when I get the sack now. I take it you, I mean, I think you obviously haven't buried the hatchet with Pierre. Do you think there's any scenario where you and him could make amends or is it? Is it Are you joking? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't tolerate him under. You know, I've got, I've got no time for him, you know. Um, and he's got no time for me, you know. Um, you know, I, I mean, when I knew what he was like. Um, you know, Bobby Houghton, who worked with me, he said he'd never dealt with a more difficult or 
irritable individual. In training, Pierre moaned about everything. The grass was too long. The grass was too low. It was too cold. It was too hot. The balls were too soft. The balls were too hard and that. So, I mean, sometimes I used to send him off with Mickey Adams because we wanted to do work on the teams. I'd send him off with Mickey Adams and D could practice free kicks and, and that, which is fair enough. And it was better because otherwise he was uh, just being a, a pain up the arse, really. How did you look back on your time with Forest overall then, Dave? What, how would you summarise it 20-odd years on? Well, I, I obviously enjoyed it. The, the year of promotion was tremendous. It was full of emotions. We, I mean, we got it on the last home game of the season. We had 90, whatever, two points, and we still won promoting, which was ridiculous. But it was a real good, and, you know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's a, a good club good training ground at that time and even better when we built we bought Wilford which was my I instigated that and said if you want a, a you know a good academy you've got to buy that ground and they must spend money on that so you know that was a right decision but you know no it was it was a good year and I was looking forward to it you know and to get promotion was a great relief and everything else because I was under pressure pressure to get promotion you know it wasn't a matter of we can you know have one season in the championship basically they wanted it straight away so that's a hell of a difference to staying in the premier league because when things turn sour and it becomes difficult it was disappointed really with hindsight i should have told them when they were sold campbell to stick their job and uh, go and manage somewhere else where you get respect I mean, do you feel vindicated then that you were right all along? You know the way they ran the club. Look at them now; they're, they're, you know, they've only made the playoffs a couple well, of times. I mean, I mean that that era where they went on the aim market and all that. We all looked great and everything else, and they made money available when I came there at that time to buy uh, Rogers and. Uh, Johnson uh, and that, to, so they made money available for that and to bring people in. Of course, it went downhill. You know, when you've got businessmen who are concerned with wanting to increase the share price and all this, that, and the other, and it don't happen, and all of a sudden they're businessmen at the end of the day. They're not real football people. They're in it to make money, and that's the case. You know, uh, you know, I laugh now. People talk about the owners of these football clubs. They're businessmen. They're not. They, they, they're in it because the the, the clubs are worth billions of pounds to them. You know, they're not going to just have any, any Tom, Dick and Harry on the board to tell them what to do. And that doesn't happen with businessmen. Mm. Who are some of the best players you worked with, Dan? You took quite a few to Barnsley with you. Who were the players you took? A, you have a lot of respect for who you worked with at Forest. Well, I, 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 I had a lot, all the respect. The only one I didn't at the end. And, I mean, Pierre was, you know, just a nuisance all the time and everything else. Um, I mean, he told me the story that when he was at Celtic, that uh, Tommy Boyd, the coach, he suggested he goes to Holland and look what is the Dutch coaches because you're useless. So I suggest you go and improve your techniques there. So that tells you something about him. Tommy, Tommy Boyd was a, a decent coach and a decent manager. So you, you, when you've got somebody is like that, you know that the eggshell life is, is there. Really, you know, we should have sold Pierre because he'd done his bit for us. He'd got us promoted. He was going to be a nuisance in the Premier League. I mean, the year, the, the games he played when he joined us in March, I think he scored about one goal in about 14. So he didn't show that he was a prolific goal scorer. The thing with Pierre, he needs people to make chances for him. He can't make them himself. And he's not the most... A uh, willing person that wants to run around to pressurising people, uh, you know, that's not in his game. His game's all about the glory. Um, what about the likes of Gamal and Woan? Uh, you took chats with you to Barnsley as well. I mean, were they a very yeah, underrated well, players? I took, yeah, I, I took Chets and, and Woney, you know, uh, yeah, they were good players. They were good good lads. You know, Steve Chettle was no problem to manage. No, Woney, Woney was, we called him Money Woney, but, it, you know, to be fair, if he'd have actually run about, he would have been a one top player. He was a top player anyway, in a way. Mm. But, uh, you know, but they, they were good. Uh, you know, Thierry Bonalaya, you know, Johnson and Rogers got on well with Stoney, was a decent bloke. You know, Kevin Campbell was served, uh, Chris Bart Williams. They, they were all good people. They were good football people. You know, I've got no complaints about them. It was just we had the one player who, who I really blame for the demise of Forrest at that time. And they still never recover from it. Of course, I can't 
blame Pierre for what happened after that because other chairmen come in, other managers come in, they've spent money and they still can't get out. And they actually went to the third division. So, I mean, really, you know, it's been 21 years of, you know, sorrow, really. You can't say that Forrest, because of what Clough did, is a first a Premier League club and it should be. No club can say that situation because we know that if you slip away, you see clubs like Sheffield Wednesday now in League One, Sheffield United up and down and various clubs like that. Crystal Palace used to be like that. So, you know, again, it, the, the, the people that have run the club or, the, or, or, you know, a combination of the boards of directors and also the managers haven't been able to pursue, uh, produce. Um, listeners would be interested in what you're up to these days, Dave. Are you still involved in the game, like watching the odd bit of scouting or anything like that for people? Or no, 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 no. I could have, I could have scouted for people, but I'm a manager, not a scout. I did scout for uh, for Alec Ferguson, a Manchester United. When I left Forest, he just rang me up and said, "Look, you know, have a rest. Come and do a bit of scouting for us." in the next uh, period. And I enjoyed that, I, going abroad. I'll tell you a story on that one. I, I, I went to Bordeaux to watch a game for Manchester United, and I'd been to Bordeaux with Nottingham Forest. Uh, when I went with Manchester United, I got better treated than I did when I was manager of Forest. <laughs> Do you miss it? Do you miss management the day-to-day? It sounds like you have a lot of stuff to deal well, with owners, but being in the yeah, dressing room... Yeah, I, I did. But, of course, now, come... Yeah, of course, you, I've missed it. I mean, you know, the, the, the way where you're as a manager, you know, the thing you miss is the interaction with the players, working with the players, match days, uh, you know, not the hour or so before the game, the actual game, the elation, the disappointment, the whole thing of it, you know. A lot of the other things you have to do, the press, you've got to do it. You don't necessarily enjoy it, but you've got to do it, and so you do it the best of your ability and that you know the the days there's you know when you've had a great performance and you win a game you know and the fans are happy you know you feel euphoric about it as well but of course when you lose you can go and be very miserable and unfortunately the losing the losses uh, affect you more than the winning what are your memories of Forest fans then? I know you had the highs and the lows at one extreme or the other. I mean, what 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 would you say about Forest fans? Yeah, the Forest fans. I wasn't sure that they really appreciated me. You know, I think there was comments. Um, I remember Brian Clough. You know, being a little bit behind the scenes. Oh, is this the manager that plays with the ball in the air and things like that? And I had a feeling, perhaps I was being a bit uh, negative myself. Um, with the Forest fans, uh, and of course they were used to a certain amount. But since uh, leaving and coming back, I found there was more um, more feeling for me than there was. You know, so you know uh, when I've ever gone back, I've always been made very, very welcome by the Forest fans. I've got to say, I really wanted Forest to be probably my last job. You know, I fancied thinking, you know, if I can do five or six years, like or seven years, I did at Sheffield United here and we can build a side then you know i'll be delighted so i was disappointed but uh, uh, things turn pear shape and what can you do about it just to say i was you know very disappointed to have to leave but of course i knew that the way it was you know it goes round, and i knew that i would have to pay the price because they just want to change they just think sometimes bringing a manager in can change it around well the atmosphere wasn't conducive to that and we didn't have enough a good enough good enough players to do that are you still watching lots of football today then are you still enjoying the game just as a fan almost i don't enjoy the football anywhere near as much as i used to there's too much backwards, sideways passing. It's all based on possession going nowhere. You know, I was always brought up that uh, the idea is to score goals. If you score more goals than the opposition, you do that. When I had the Wimbledon and the Sheffield United teams, we weren't the best, but we never played negatively. When we went to Old Trafford, we went for it. We might lose 4-1 four four or something, but then, we, you know, to, I've won at Old Trafford, I've won at Anfield, I've won at all these Chelsea and all those places by being positive, you know, and again, my sides have had situations when we come to Forest. I mean, my record against Forest was excellent with Wimbledon. I, uh, I think I lost once. We then, you know, 
beat them in the cup, beat them in the League Cup, and it was always very good. We always fancied ourselves. We knew Forest were a good side, don't get me wrong, but we went for it. We, if we sat back, we did it. And we went to Wimbledon, we went to Old Trafford, Anfield, Tottenham, Chelsea, won there. We won by being straightforward, and again, with Sheffield United. So I've always wanted a positive side, and, you know, the Forest side we had was a positive side because we scored all those goals. Mm. Do you think managers overcomplicate the game now then? They just try and be too clever by half? Well, I overcomplicate. I just sometimes wonder whether they think about winning. I mean, I hear a lot of managers saying we play the right way. Well, what is the right way? You know, if you're losing and you're bottom of the league, you can't be playing the right way, can you? If you're at the top, you must be doing something right. So, you know, I think there's this stigma that... Uh, you know, that's been brought in, that this DNA, that you've got to roll the ball out of the back and you've got to start there. You know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And then the, the way it was, it went with those times, you know, you met different teams who played different, you know, and they all change it now. But there seems to be this uh, uh, incident that they talk about possession, which the media talk about. And I think I saw Carlo Ancelotti said possessions never won anything. Um, as we record this, we're right on the eve of the Euros. Can I trouble you for a prediction? This is going to come out after England's first game, so they might have lost and be right up against it. But can we trouble you for a prediction for the Euros? Well, I, I've uh, I fancy Italy. I've uh, uh, I've had a, I can bet because I'm not with a club. I've had a bet they get win it. I've had a bet they get to the final, or I bet to the semi final. I just think that. Uh, they may be in the right frame of mind that there to do it. I think, obviously, you know, it's easy to go for France because they've got some very good players in France as well. And I think England have got some very, very good players. You know, I think uh, in this day and age, to Mason Mount is and um, Foden are tremendous players. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're top notch at an early age. You know, they're like Rooney at the age he was and Bobby Charlton at the age he was and everything else. And, you know, I still think that Reese James has is, is got the potential to, to, to do very, very well. Um, so, again, with the, with the front players, Harry Kane is a top, top player. Uh, and in my opinion, he should clear off from Tottenham and go and enjoy himself with one of the top clubs because Tottenham are not going to be a top club for 10 years till they get the debts paid off. So, uh, yeah, I think we've got some good, very good players. Well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, Dave. Uh, thanks very much for giving us so much of your time. Um, thanks to everyone who listens along as normal. And we shall be back with another special uh, this time next week. Dave, uh, thank you very much. And do look after yourself. And I hope you enjoy the Euros. Yeah, cheers, Matt. Thank you very much. I should be watching the games. Hopefully, I'll get some entertainment. Or I might be grazing, grazing on Sky Arts. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening. Yeah.